And the, the story of Louis Samprini is pretty neat because here's a guy who, um, you know, was destined for to be an Olympic uh, runner. He had uh, actually participated in the 1936 Olympics in Berlin and was uh, set a record for a, a lap in the 5,000 meters and then was going to go on and do more. And then World War II came along and he enlisted in the Air Force. And in a rescue mechanical failure and he for Liberator, uh, his plane crashed because of mechanical failure and him and two other guys were adrift on the sea for 47 days. And that's a miracle in of itself that he survived that. But then, to top it off, he gets captured by the Japanese, is tortured mercilessly for the next couple years, and, you know, is just, you know, but the, the story of Unbroken, he just did not surrender to the Japanese. You know, he didn't surrender his will um, and came out of that alive. But what this movie does is it picks up after that, and it talks about his spiritual journey. He has uh, major PTSD, as anybody might expect afterwards, becomes an alcoholic, is on the verge of losing his marriage. His wife gets saved um, and just trying to basically begs him to go to a Billy Graham crusade. And the cool part about this movie clip is the guy that plays Billy Graham is William Graham, Billy's grandson, Franklin's, Franklin's oldest son. So, and he actually does, uh, he's an evangelist as well. So there's a third generation going on there with that. So I thought that was kind of a cool, fun fact there for you. Um, and anyway, he gets, you know, he gets saved and then he becomes a great evangelist, uh, Louis Zamprini does, and speaking on the power of forgiveness. He's able to forgive those who hurt him. And my thought, though, as I was looking at that, I just really felt like the Holy Spirit saying, you know, if we all stand up and cheer when someone surrenders their life to Jesus, why aren't more of us living surrendered lives to Christ? And, and I speak to myself on this, you know, on a daily basis, you know, we get saved and we're very sincere. And then maybe some days I'm giving 40% to God. Maybe it's 60%. Maybe on a really good day I'm hitting 80, you know. But I think it's not because of lack of sincerity or desire, but three reasons that we're going to go over tonight and kind of look at some of those deeper things. And I'm just going to hit them real quick and then we'll go into more detail but the three reasons that I think keep us from being fully surrendered on a daily basis is, one, it's unnatural. We'll talk about that. Another, it feels controlling. Surrendering to God does feel controlling. And let's be honest, sometimes it just doesn't sound fun, you know? And I'm not being sarcastic, but, but there's just truth to that, that a lot of people will say that. But I really believe that if we understood fully surrender from God's perspective— I believe we would beg God to manage every aspect of our lives, every day. I really do, because it'd be like that Carrie Underwood song, Jesus, Take the Wheel, um, because I just feel like that's what God wants. He wants to take control. And it's not, again, because he wants to do all these other things that we think of sometimes as the world. So we're going to talk about tonight just building a case for surrender, and I'm going to keep it short because I know we're all sweating, and if you're not, you're lying. It is hot. So... But we're going to go through these. And the first one we talk about, you know, we say, you know, well, surrender is not natural. And I'm going to say, yeah, it is not natural to surrender. But as I tell a lot of people, natural got you here. Wherever here is for you, you know, online or, or, or in this building, wherever you're at, you know, natural is what, what got you to where you're at. You know, rebellion is natural, not surrender. A baby is born with clenched fists. They're pretty angry, actually. I remember my daughter, once she calmed down and they revived me because I fainted, um, then, it, they, you know, she was just, you know, they're born with just, just angry, like, why'd you take me out of that comfort zone? And the first sin in history is Satan rebelling against God, wanting to do his own thing, and the world has really been rebelling ever since. And it wasn't hard for Satan to convince Adam and Eve to rebel either. You know, if you really think about it, he didn't have to work that hard because it's natural to rebel. Surrender is not natural. I like how, as Timothy Keller puts it, we all have a little King Herod in us. I, I thought that was just so true. Um, and so I remember when I work with couples especially, but also just anybody in counseling, you know, our, our goal, my goal a lot of times over the years was to try to train them into some other, a, a different kind of listening, a uh, different kind of communication technique, um, you know, just coming home, you know, just the basics. And, uh, but 
the idea was is that a lot of times people would say, oh, this is so hard. It's just not natural. And I'd always tell them, natural got you in my office. You know, if doing what comes natural is why we're meeting at all. And I think that's important to realize because what comes natural is oftentimes sin. I always think, you know, if all of us just did what came naturally, many of us would probably be dead or in jail. And I like the verse in 1 Corinthians 10, 23, where it says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. And so I think that first thing we want to debunk a lot of times when we, because the enemy will come to us and we'll say that, oh, you know, it just doesn't feel natural. We'll say this a lot of times, it just doesn't feel right, you know, and and I think sometimes we have to come back and just go, so many times in my life, what was natural got me in trouble. You know, overeating was natural for me, got me in trouble as I just went to my doctor recently. Um, you know, and just you, you think about it, a lot of those things that we do gets you in trouble. And so God, when we think about surrendering, you know, it might be a little bit challenging, but I want to just kind of challenge us to go, it's, it's not natural, but it is beneficial. The second thing that a lot of times the enemy comes and says to us, oh, but God is just trying to control you. I hear this from people all the time. He just wants to make me do things, you know. He's got all these rules that just are, you know, and he wants to just, wants to control me. And I always kind of think, first of all, God gives us free will. Why would he give us free will and then just want to subjugate us? It would just seem like, a, uh, you know, counterproductive. We'd just be robots otherwise. So that kind of nails that one. But if we really think about it, the truth is God wants us to be surrendered to him to protect us, not to control us. He can control us just as easy, you know, that's not hard for him to do, but he wants to protect us. And you look at Leviticus as a great example of this. A lot of the Levitical laws that he gave to the Israelites, I've had a lot of people tell me, oh, God was just kind of a fun killer, you know, he just was, you know, just trying to control them and tell them what to do. And but when you really look at them and take them apart, you know, God commanded his people to not eat, you know, pigs and, you know, horses and fish without scales or fins and scavengers like, you know, crabs, clams, oysters, things like that. He did command them to eat cattle, sheep, and elk or, you know, and other animals that, that eat grass. And the main reason is science backs this up is because when the animals that eat grass are what, the, what they digest and, and how the, the, the meat that we get from them is so much easier and healthier for our body to deal with than these other animals. And back then, pork was tri had trichinosis. Shellfish was just, I mean, we still have people who get major shellfish injuries. I like what one person said, you know, anybody that eats an oyster is basically just chewing on a vacuum cleaner bag, you know, because of what they, you know, and I'm not picking on anybody who likes oysters, but I'm just saying, it's true when you think about it. So God was saying what they eat is going to go into you too. So he was like, be careful what you eat. It wasn't, again, it was to protect his people. And then also when you think about it, God wanted his people to avoid fatty diets and to practice basic sanitation to give them greater health and minimize diseases. So again, he's got, you got probably over a million people. I don't know how many Israelites at that time, but it was a lot, all in a big area and there was potential for major epidemics that could have broke out there. And so, again, God was saying all these things he wanted them to do, he wanted them to be healthy. I'm sure manna was probably like the healthiest thing you could eat and probably tasted amazing. It was like Nutrisystem can't even beat that. You know, so, so the first thing we look at God wanting to protect us is just in the basic eating and, and, and sanitation and things like that. But also when God asks us, sometimes it's hard for people when they hear God saying, submit to authority. You know, that can feel a little bit, oh, I don't like that idea. But again, when we think about it, God wants us to submit to authority to protect us. Because if we're covered, then God deals with authority first. We might get some collateral damage. But when a church goes down, unfortunately, when a nation goes down, when a, a marriage goes down, God's going to go to the leader first and say, what happened there? And Satan's always going after the leader first. He's going to try to derail the leader. That's his primary topic. His primary target is going to be leaders because he can take down everybody else, possibly. So when we are submitted, when we are surrendered to God, 
So God designed surrender to be a place where I love to be able to just go to church, give my tithe, not worry about where it goes. I don't want to have to think about those kinds of things. I want to be able to, and that's why we want to pray for our pastors and, and leaders and stuff, because they are the target. And we're not. And so I just think sometimes being able to realize that I loved, uh, John Bevere wrote a book years ago called Undercover. And when I read that probably 20 years ago, that really changed my perspective on authority because by, the, you know, at that time I was kind of a pretty sniveling 20 something year old that still thought I knew everything. And it was really easy to just say, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. As soon as the pastor would say something I didn't agree with, I'm out of there, you know. And I just kind of bounced around. This was before I met my wife. Um, I don't think she would have put up with that. But it's just the idea until I understood undercover and still I realized that it was for my protection. Being under a boss was great. You know, I've, at jobs that I've had in the past, I didn't have to worry about all the details. I could just show up to work. But the boss was the one that had it. So I was protected by that. So I think, you know, I just think it's kind of interesting. If we willingly surrender to a pilot when we get on a plane because we trust their ability over ours to get us to our destination, why are we so unwilling to fully surrender to the one who created the pilot? You know, and I, I just think that sometimes when I got on a plane, I always imagine that. So every law, principle, or mandate God asks us or commands us to surrender to from the Old Testament to the New Testament from then till now is for our benefit. Every single one of them. You're not going to see one thing in the Bible where it's like, oh, that was a buzzkill, you know, or God was just trying to control me or do something. Everything is for my benefit. Even if we don't understand it, it is still for our benefit. And I think that's important to remember. So surrender is protection. And then the last thing, like we said, sometimes it just doesn't feel fun. And this is where a lot of people, you know, when I was younger especially, but I think anybody can say, you know, God is just trying to take my fun, you know. And what I'm going to tell you is surrender actually increases your fun, if you really think about it from God's perspective. And I'll prove it to you. When I was, you know, younger, I love this show. I, I've always liked documentaries. I like history and just th those kinds of things. And there was a documentary that was done by MTV. Uh, I know all of you guys know this one because you're hip about that. But it was called Behind the Music. And they would chronicle every week a different 80s rock band, hair band, you know. And Def Leppard, Motley Crue, some of those people, those ones we won't admit that we listen to in church. And what was interesting about it is, is they always started out the same. These people come from nowhere. They get a, a big hit. They make millions of dollars. They tour all over the world. And then, then they get into drugs. Then they get into, you know, promiscuity. Then they get into, you know, all these different things, partying and stuff. And then they end tragically every time. It's, it's so sad. You know, I was just sad to hear that. It's like, you know, somebody committed suicide or somebody overdosed or marriages broke up, you know, Fleetwood Mac, or, you know, you name it. You know, it was just happening. And what it told me was, it's just like the thing that, that we would say was so fun, that started out so fun, turned pretty bad in a hurry, you know, because they weren't doing it God's way. And so I think, you know, when you look at the, the, the story of in Genesis 3, where, you know, what does Satan come and he, and he does to, to Eve? He didn't have to work that hard because all he had to do was get her to believe that God was holding out on her. God's stealing your fun. There's just two trees you can't have. Now, he didn't tell you, okay, Eve, you get all this other stuff. He didn't tell her, tell her all the things God is blessing her with. He just focused on the things that she, you know, convinced her to believe that God was holding out on her, you know. And so, and I, and I believe that what's interesting is God wasn't holding out on her. There was just things God didn't want her to have to deal with. You know, once she bites into the, the, the apple for the tree of, of knowledge and good and evil, God didn't want her to have to deal with evil. You know, you're living in a perfect environment. Now, all of a sudden, she's exposed to all these things. I think of that verse that says, don't awaken love before it's time. And you see so many people who get in these relationships, you know, dating in high school. It's like you have a 3% chance that you're going to stay with that person the rest of your life. Those are terrible odds, you know. But you have a 100% chance you're going to get some heartache, you know. And so I just think that that idea of, you know, just we get you all of a sudden it's really easy even even mature christians can start going like you know oh god you're just stealing my fun you know i even thought you know there was a couple times in the past where there was like a show i was watching i won't name it because you'll just go out and watch it you know i'm just kidding 
But it was a sitcom, and it was just a very funny sitcom. And, and yet I just felt the Holy Spirit convicting me that this is just not a good thing to watch. Because even though it was funny, it just had all this other stuff that was added to it. And it really was, I never felt good when I walked away from that. So it really wasn't that fun, you know. And I think that's important to realize. So I just think imagining the other part, you know, imagine your favorite game or your favorite sport without structure, without rules. It would be chaos. When I was in grade school, we played this game. I can't even remember the name of the game. But the basic rule was there are no rules. It was whoever had the ball got creamed. And I think the only person that probably liked that sport was the school nurse because it gave her job security because somebody was always getting hurt. But I played that a few times, and I was like, this is crazy. I cannot keep up with this anymore because it had no structure. It wasn't fun. You know, football, one of the reasons that football, whether you like football or not, it's still one of the best, the top sports, grossing sports in the world because they are innovative in the way they do their rules. And they have such a great structure which keeps the flow of the game going. Baseball is struggling because they can't figure out how to do the rules the right way. And so you can see an example right there where two things that are supposed to be fun, but one is more fun because of the structure that it's put up with. And I just think, you know, when you really look at it, how many free spirits do you really admire in life? You know, we always think of those like, they're fun. Oh, that person just parties all the time, does whatever they want. But those aren't the people we really admire. When you think throughout history, it's the people who led disciplined lives, who, who stayed steady, who hung in there. The guy that wrote, it is well with my soul after he loses almost all his family, in a, in a, you know, in an a accident at sea. I mean, those are the people we really admire. So God's all about fun, you know. If you really hang out with God and, and, and give him a chance, He's totally about fun, but he wants us to surrender to life his way so we don't have to deal with the residue, the consequences of sin. He wants fun without those consequences, and that's when we surrender to him. That's what we get. So sin is pleasurable for a season, as the Bible says, but it always leads to death in some form or another. It's fun for a little bit. Everything is fun for a little bit. So, uh, you know, in Luke 5, 5 through 7, you know, it says, Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled to their partners, to the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled their boats so full that they began to sink. Now, I'm not a fisherman. That doesn't sound fun. But if you are a fisherman, that probably sounds pretty fun. To have so many fish, your boat is starting to sink. You know, and I, I, we were, those of you who were at um, Mike's Celebration of Life service, Mike Tucker, last night, you know, they talked a lot about fishing, and that was one of the things he loved to do, and he loved to get as many as he possibly could. So when, you know, I, I love that line when Peter says, but God, if you say to do it, I'm going to do it. And then all of a sudden, he has a blast. You know, he's got his all buddies all together. They probably were gutting fish for days and having a good old time, you know. So I just want to wrap up with this. Uh, in conclusion, 45 more minutes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Surrender to God is not a one-time thing. It's a daily discipline. The only reason we don't embrace it more is because we don't understand it from God's perspective, like we talked about. And I don't think, or, you know, I look back on my life, and I look at a lot of things, you know, I didn't tithe for years because I thought God wanted to take from me instead of give to me. And it's, an, you know, I struggled in my marriage, my wife can attest to this, for years because I tried to do things my way instead of God's way. You know, it's funny, I could love her a lot better when I started doing it God's way. You know, and she could tell you that for sure. And just like we want our kids to surrender to our will so we can help them achieve their potential, Hannah, yeah. God wants us to do things his way, not to control us or to steal our fun, but to give us life and life more abundantly. And the fact that you are in this building tonight or watching online once we upload it just proves that you realize your way doesn't work. So Jesus, thank God that Jesus chose to surrender to the Father's will. You know, he didn't have to. And he even said, oh, if there's another way, 
please take this from me. But he said, not my will, but yours be done. And it wasn't fun. He might have felt a little, you know, frustrated at the time. But because of him, we have life and life more abundantly. So because of his surrender, and that's our example. So Satan will try and trick you into believing that surrendering to God will fence us in. But as we have proved tonight, surrendering our total will to God will actually give us more freedom and fun than we could ever imagine. But honestly, the choice is yours. You know, and I'm saying that to myself and to everybody else. I just really feel like God wants us and is calling the church to, to if we're going to look different compared to the world, we can't just surrender here and there. And we don't have to be self-righteous either. We can have a good time, you know, go to a movie, do things and stuff, but we got to do it God's way. And it's just going to turn out so much better. And I can, I've learned that from example because I've done everything my own way pretty much that you could imagine, and it's turned out terrible. You know. So I want to pray, and then let's get out of here and go to some place where it's cooler, like anywhere else. So, Lord, we just thank you so much for just the opportunity to come here tonight and, uh, and just be in your presence. Where two or more are gathered, we are, you're, you're here. And so I just ask that this word would, would not go out void, that, that it would touch hearts. And it would just, throughout the day, tonight, tomorrow, throughout our week, Lord, you would just really show us areas where we need to give to you, things that we have held on to that we need to surrender to you. We want to be fully surrendered to you. Lord, if there are people out there watching tonight, either in this building or online later, that do not know you, help them to be able to realize that they want to take that first step, like Louis Zamprini in the video, and just give their heart to you, Jesus. You know, all they got to do is just confess with their mouth and believe with their heart in their, in their heart that you are Lord and that you rose from the, from the dead, rose from the dead, and, 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 you know, you will take care of their sins, Lord. So just give them the courage to take that first step. And we ask this all now in your precious name. Amen. All right.